Namaste and good afternoon. Let me begin by thanking the organizers of the Mysuru Lit Fest and all the various book clubs that are part of the process for having invited me here. I've been to various lit fests, but this is the first time I've come to Mysuru. I hope it's not going to be the last. <laughs> the topic that I chose to speak on is governance lessons from Itihasa Pradhana. Most of the time, when authors speak at lit fests, they speak about books that they have already written, about books that have been published. I'm going to give you a flavor of a book that I have not yet written. I've been stuck on the first chapter for a long time, largely because of paucity of time. So if you like, I'm going to give you a preview of a book that might be published in some indeterminable date in the future. First, let me spend a little bit of time on the Itihasa Purana part. The word Itihasa, which means in Sanskrit, Itihasa, this is indeed what happened. So Itihasa, translated into English, should be history. Itihasa, this is indeed what happened. The word Itihasa was originally ascribed to the Mahabharata. Then it came to be ascribed to the Ramayana also, by which I mean Valmiki Ramayana, as most of you present here know. While there are known Sanskrit versions of the Ramayana, there are Sanskrit versions of the Ramayana different from the Valmiki Ramayana. And I am not talking only about Kalidasa and Ramamoksha. So the word Itihasa came to be attributed to both the Valmiki Ramayana and the Mahabharata together. And then you have the Puranas. There are Puranas and Puranas. Some of these are known as major Puranas or Mahapuranas. Others are known as Upa Puranas or Minor Puranas. The list of major Puranas is more or less standardized throughout the country wherever you may happen to be. There are 18 of these. These are known as Ashtagash Mahapurana. The Upa Puranas, which I'm only going to mention and not talk about, are also believed to be 18 in number, but the list varies from one part of the country to another part of the country. But as I said, I'm not here to talk about the Upa Puranas. So, Itihas Purana means Valmiki Rama and Mahabharat and Ashtadash Mahabharas. The perception is something like the following Veda Vyasa classified, reclassified, redivided the Vedas. Of 
after he had done that, he composed the Mahabharata. After he had composed the Mahabharata, he composed the 18 Puranas. This is the usual perception we have. I will come back to this in a minute. But first let me tell you a little bit about our conception of time. I'm sure most of you know about it. Even then I need to spend a little bit on the conception of time. There is a notion of time known as a kalpa. Kalpa is one of Brahma's days. Diti Hasa Purana Corpus tells us that Brahma's lifespan in his years is 100 years. Brahma is also subject to, on a different time scale, to creation and dissolution. So his lifespan is one of hundred years. When it is Brahma's morning, he wakes up and he starts this process of secondary creation. And the Kalpa lasts. When his day is over, Brahma <coughs> <coughs> when his day, excuse me, I've got a very bad quote. When Brahma's day is over, he goes to sleep and the secondary dissolution happens. If you go to a mandir to do a puja, you will sometimes not notice that the Purahit who is offering the puja on your behalf will say Shweta Varaha Kalpe because Kalpas come and go the Kalpa we are in now is known as the Shweta Varaha Kalpa named after Vishnu's Varaha Avatar the Purahit will not only say Shweta Varaha Kalpe he will also say Vaivaswat Manvantari. So one of the notions of time is in terms of Manus. In a Kalpa, there are 14 Manvantars. In every Kalpa, there are 14 Manvantars. Today, in our present Kalpa of Shweta Varaha Kalpa, we are in the seventh Manvantara. This seventh Manu is Vaivaswat Manu. He is known as Vaivaswat Manu because he was the son of Surya Vivaswam, the son lord. Hence, Shweta Varaha Kalpe Vaivaswat Purely in passing, in every Manvantara, the names of the Devas are different. The Devas also come and go. In every Manvantara, the names of the Saptarshis are different. In every Manvantara, the Indra is different. So when we say Indra in this Manvantara, that particular Indra is Purandara. The Indra who will come in the next Manvantara is the famous Bali who was vanquished by Vishnu in his Vamana Avatar. The Manvantara conception of time is something that is popularly not that well known. What is much more well known, relatively speaking, is the division 
इंटू फोर युग सत्य युग और कृत युग त्रेता युग द्वापर युग एंड कल युग सत्य युग और कृत युग लास्ट फॉर फोर थाउजेंड इयर्स त्रेता युग लास्ट फॉर थ्री थाउजेंड इयर्स वापर युग लास्ट फॉर टू थाउजेंड इयर्स एंड कल युग लास्ट फॉर वन थाउजेंड इयर्स सो दैट टोटल साइकिल is of 10000 years but in addition in between two yugas there is an intervening period the two intervening periods for satya yuga or krita yuga of 400 years for treta yuga 300 years for dwapar yuga 200 years and for kali yuga 100 so the entire cycle is not 10000 years the entire cycle is of 12000 years i said a kalpa has 14 manvantaras a kalpa also has 71.4 of the cycles of maju in every 20 in every dwapar yuga a veda vyasa is born so when we say veda vyasa composed the mahabharata please let us realize veda vyasa is a type i said in every kalpa there is a cycle of 71.4 yugas that cycle we are in the 28th of that so the text tell us 27 veda vyasas has come and gone before this we have their names this particular veda vyasa that we are talking about is the 28th in the line his real name veda vyas was a title his real name was krishna dwaipayan krishna because he was dark dwaipayan because he was born in an island or deepa i told you earlier that the popular perception is this particular veda vyas classified the vedas composed the mahabharata and composed the puranas it is not that simple nothing was quite linear like that those of you who have read the puranas or some of the puranas will know that the bhagavat purana is largely narrated by shukadeva veda vyasa's son but in the mahabharata we are told about shukadeva's merging into nature so quite patently it is obvious that the bhagavat purana could not have been composed after the mahabharata in all probability what happened was these had independent origins which tended to get assimilated together in the texts as we know them today exactly similarly if i were to digress for a minute there is a popular perception that the valmiki ramayana was composed before the mahabharata i'm not talking about the incidents i'm talking about the composition of the text why because in the valmiki ramayana there is a reference to the ramavakyan story there is no such reference to the ramayana story in the mahabharata hence people will say 
Valmiki Raman must have been composed before the Mahabharata. The Valmiki Raman is essentially a story of Surya Vamsha, the solar dynasty. And the incidents of the Valmiki Ramayana almost happened along a north-south axis. The Mahabharata is largely a narration of Chandra Vamsha, the lunar dynasty. And the incidents of Mahabharata generally happen along an east-west axis. Suppose I were to mention Yayati. Is King Yayati a Surya Vamsha king or a Chandra Vamsha king? He's a Chandra Vamsha king. So how come his name figures in the Valmiki Ramayana? Suppose I were to tell you, ask you, Na Tvang Shochitum Arhasi. Where does this come from? <coughs> Many of you will say, it comes from the Bhagavad Gita. But this expression, without mentioning the Bhagavad Gita, occurs repeatedly in the Valmiki Ramayana. Which is why I said, let us not have very simple notions about Valmiki Ramayana being composed before the Mahabharata as we know them today, or the Mahabharata being composed before the Puranas as we know them today. To the extent we can date them, not the incidents, but the composition, what we know. Roughly speaking, we know that the fight that the Valmiki Ramayana and the Mahabharata, this was a process of oral transmission. And this process of oral transmission oh, happened over a period of 1000 years, 500 BCE to 500 CE, thereabouts. The Puranas started being composed there were early Puranas as well as, as later ones. The early Puranas started being composed around 300 CE, the latest ones around 1200 CE. So those are the timelines. Itihas Purana is described as Pancham Veda. In Chandoka Upanishad, the Rishi Narad goes to the Rishi Sanat Kumar and says, please instruct me. Any student goes to any teacher, the teacher first says, let me first try and figure out what do you know before I begin to teach you. And in response, Narada says, I know Itihas Purana, Pancham Veda. The Itihas Purana corpus was important enough to be called Pancham Veda. Why Pancham Veda? Because what the Itihas Purana corpus did was to communicate through popular stories the principles of the Vedas. All of us know the story of Vishnu's Matsya Avatar. We know that story about Manu. Where Manu went to bathe in a river, saw a small fish. Fish said, I'm scared of the larger fish. Manu brought that fish home, placed it in a pot. It grew larger and larger. All of us know that story. Those of you who know Jayadeva's Dashavatar, Stotram Pralaya Payati Jalitritavana Sivedam Vihita Vahitram Charitram Akedam Keshavatrita Meena Sharida. First avatar. Throughout the world, there are stories about a great flood. Every day. How many years ago, 
about 12,000 BC. 12,000 BC, 11,000 BC, thereabouts. <coughs> Remember I talked about that cycle of 12,000 years? <coughs> Go back 12,000 years from now, we are at the period of that flood. The start of that current cycle of Satyayu. There have been attempts to date the incidents of the Mahabharata. This is extremely controversial. And there are all kinds of people who attempt to date it using astronomical references. If dating is only done on the basis of astronomical references, you need to be extremely skeptical for various reasons. Our astronomical calculations varied widely. They were essentially based on lunar mass, not solar mass. In some parts, the month ended with Purnima. In some places, the month ended with Amavasya. Our calculations were based on nakshatras. Rashis came much later. And most importantly, of course, a shloka is not unambiguous in terms of determining a graha or nakshatra. So when an astrologer or an astronomer uses only astronomical data, there is a lot of subjectivity often in the computation. We should use that astronomical data only when it can be triangulated with other sources of data and there are other sources of data, like epigraphic data, archaeological data, evidence now on genetic evolution, evolution of grammar, geological changes like the drying up of the Saraswati and so on and so forth. If you do all of that, you will come to about 1500, 1600 BCE, give or take a couple of hundred years for the incidents of the Kurukshetra war. In 10,000 BCE, what was India's population? What was Bharatvasha's population? Of course, today's India is not the same as Bharat Varsha then. But roughly speaking, what was Bharat Varsha's population? The human mind often finds it difficult to accept the exponential function. The exponential function shoots up like this. We are more used to the linear function. And of course, you know from the newspapers, India has become the most populous country in the world now. Going back backwards also, the exponential function works. Yes, it's very difficult to go back backwards, but around 10,000 BCE, Bharat Vashya's population was around 1,500 people. That's it. 1,500. Remember that figure because I will come back to this. Around 1500 BCE, roughly Krishna's time, what was the Indian Bharat Vashya's population? 3.5 million people. From 1500 to 3.5 million. What do our texts tell us? Our texts tell us that in Satya Yuga, you did not need kings. People were naturally inclined to dharma. Dharma can only be imperfectly translated as religion. It should not be translated as religion. Dharma is anything that holds up society, that holds up the fabric of society. dharma. People were naturally prone to dharma. 
they did not need kings. When did kings start to arrive? In Kreta Yuga. There were no kings before Kreta Yuga. What is the role for kings? If I ask you, give me a Sanskrit or a Kanara word for king. Some of you will say in Dripa. Narapati, variants of that. Nripati, Narapati, they mean Lord of Men. Someone or the other will say Raja. <coughs> a Raja. Every Nripa is not a Raja. Rajan is a king who delights the subjects. That is the etymological meaning of the word Raja. The texts tell us that in Treta Yuga, the first king evolved. And this first Rajan's name, not first king, first Rajan's name was Prithu. Prithu's father, Vera, was a ripper but was not a rajan, so he was killed. And thereafter, Prithu originated. He was known as Prithu because he was originated as a result of the kneading of Vena's arms, which were pretty thick. The word Prithu means thick, large. Prithu was the first king. He set out rules for punishing the wicked. For protecting the virtuous. He set out rules for exploiting the earth. He built cities. He leveled mountains. He established rules for agriculture and exploiting the earth. As a result of which, the earth became his daughter. And hence the earth is known as Prithvi or Prithivi. Beginning of Satya Yuga, 10,000 BC, 1,500 people, small community. When you have small communities, people do not, people know each other. If you know each other, you tend to be much more civilized. You need proper rules only when you begin to deal with people with whom you have relationships people who are anonymous. And if there is anonymity, people can be very uncivilized. You can see it on social media, you can see it in crowds. So the moment the population begins to explode from that 1500, of course you need a king, you need dharma. Because as the texts tell us, that down the years, from Satya Yuga to Treta Yuga to Dwapar Yuga to Kali Yuga, Dharma declines by one fourth. So to speak, it has four feet in Satya Yuga. Treta Yuga, it has three feet. Dwapar Yuga, it has one. Two feet. Kali Yuga, it has one. Veda Vyasa is believed to have composed the Mahabharata in a hundred thousand shakas. The 18 Puranas together have 400,000 shakas. In the introduction it was mentioned that I did an unabridged translation of the Mahabharata in English. Whenever I'm talking about translations, I'm talking about translations in English. This is the third unabridged translation of the Mahabharata in English. The last two were done by Kishori Mohan Ganguly between 1883 and 1893 and Manmathana Dantta in the 1890s, which simply proves that Bengalis are mad enough to embark on such misadventures. A little tidbit 
or Her Royal Highness. <laughs> the second one to translate it was Manmakana Tatta. Manmatana Datta was conferred the title of Shastri by the then Royal Highness of Mysore. Oh. This is not a hint to you. <laughs> After that, I did the Valmiki Ramayana, an average translation. The Valmiki Ramayana has been translated a bit more in English, on average, five times. After that, I started to translate the Puranas. I repeat, the Mahabharata runs into 100,000 shlokas. The translation I did, which is based on the critical edition, which has a fewer number of shlokas, it has 10 volumes, runs into 2.25 million words. The Mahapuranas, 400,000 shlokas, will run into 12 million words more. One of the reasons I am here, I will mention this and then I will come back to the governance bit. So I am on this arduous task of translating all the Mahapuranas in unabridged Five of them have been published. Bhagavad Purana, Markandeya Purana, Brahma Purana, Vishnu Purana and Shiva Purana. When I say a Purana has been published, do realize a Purana has multiple volumes. They vary enormously in size. The one that is sitting with Penguin is the Brahmanda Purana, which has extensive sections on Lalita Devi. The one I am working on now is Matsya Purana. That's part of the reason why I am here. What has it got to do with governance? The word governance is used as a buzzword. Everyone uses it. What is governance? Why do we use a word like governance? Do we mean government? If we mean government, why don't we simply say government? Why say governance? There are sophisticated definitions of governance coming through the World Bank, coming through EU, coming through OECD. If you distill out all of these definitions of governance, you will find what distinguishes governance from government is the role of citizens. In that sense, governance is over and above government. Governance is about sabka prayas. Government is what government does. What the king in those days did, purely as a caricature and no more. There are two extreme models in the world, purely as a caricature. Because that ideal does not exist anywhere in the world. One of these is capitalism as an ideal caricature where all the decisions were ta are taken by individuals or the market. The other caricature is extreme socialism, where all decisions are taken by the state. Our texts give us a third model which we have forgotten about. And that is, about a significant role played by the community. We have forgotten about that. Was there a competition commission of India then to ensure that there were no unfair trade practices or restrictive business practices? No. 
their trainees, for want of a better word, the guilds, did that. Who ensured MRP? The trainees of the skill or the or the trainees of the guilds did that. Who ensured skill development? The trainees of the guilds did that. And I'm not talking about thousands of years ago. I'm not talking about 1500 BCE. One of the good things about the British was that the British documented everything in sight. They produced all India gazetteers and then they began to produce district level gazetteers. Ambala District Gazetteer for the year 1883. What's happening in Ambala in 1883? A canal has to be built. How much is that canal going to cost in rupees in 1883 rupees? 45,000 rupees. How much did the government of the day pay? 20,000. Who paid the remaining 25,000? The community did. Today you suggest that? <laughs> Why do we pay the government taxes for? We are talking about cleaning up the Ganga today. In 1886, the community started to clean up the Ganga. The water bodies who are maintained by local bodies. Someone invites us for dinner. I don't know who's going to invite me today for dinner. That doesn't matter. But generally someone invites us for dinner. So I and my wife decide to scratch our heads. What will we take as a gift? Do they drink? Shall it be a bottle of wine? Bouquet of flowers? That's completely Western in notion. In our tradition, it is the host who gives the guest a gift. A guest is Atithi. Atithi is not a guest about whom you know in advance. Atithi means a tithi. A guest who is pre-announced is not an Atithi. An Atithi is a guest who turns up uninvited, unknown. In the course of my work, I often travel outside Delhi. I'm not talking about metros. I go to rural parts of India or non-metro parts of India. Wherever I go, if it happens to be around mealtime, the head of the household or the lady of the household will say, Bhojan karke jayi. That is part of our tradition. The guest is offered a seat, Padya to wash the feet, Achamaniya to rinse the mouth, a gift, food, place to sleep in the night. Going back to governance, the normal portrayal of Hinduism is that Hinduism is otherworldly. It is about moksha dharma. It is about freeing oneself from the bonds of samsara. It is about the Upanishads. Of course it is that. But that does not mean that Hindus were not concerned about this world. If I look at the sacred books of the East, edited by Max Muller, what was translated? Shakuntala, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Vedanta. If I walk into any library and go to the books that have engineering and come out and deduce that this college this did not teach literature, that would be completely misleading. We are not looking at the texts that talk about the behavior of householders. Moksha Dharma, the Bhagavad Gita, amongst other texts, tells us that among scrolls and crows of people, only
only the limited few will be free from the cycle of samsara. The rest of us are stuck with samsara. We are grihasthas. We are not going off on vanaprastha. We are not going off on sannyasa. And the householder then did exactly what the household is trying to do today. To pursue dharma, kama and artha in the non-moksha sense. Earn wealth, hopefully through legitimate means. And do the Panchamaha Yagya, which is tending to devas, rishis, humans, animals, birds, and do Ishta and Puti. What is Ishta and Puti? The dividing line is thin. Ishta is like something desired, ghostly sacrifices. Purti, the root, is filling up so its civic works. So we are supposed to do all of this as decent householders without the danda of corporate social responsibility. <laughs> this is what we were supposed to do on our own. But then, as I said, we have forgotten about this. Where is all of this described? A lot is spoken about Kautilya. Kautilya, let me remind you, Arthashastra was a manuscript that was completely forgotten about until in this city, Professor Sharma Shastri discovered the manuscript and translated it. There is something called the National Manuscript Mission at Namami, which is in the business of listing manuscripts. Digitization comes much later. Listing manuscripts. Manuscript being defined <coughs> as anything that's more than 75 years old. Private collections as well as public collections. <coughs> Excuse me. Namami's estimate is there are 40 million manuscripts in India. Within the country. 95% have still not been translated. So we don't even know what knowledge exists in them. I have a 12th century manuscript which I have no intention of translating. It's called Chodya Shastra. As the title implies, it is a manual for thieves. <laughs> if I were to translate it, it would become a book of 500 pages. But there is plenty on governance, which as I said, we have forgotten about in the Itihas Purana Corpus. Not just Bhishma lying down on his bed of arrows. These are the 19 most important kinds of civil cases that you must try in order of priority. Guess what was one of the most important in that day and age? Breach of contract. This is Bhishma lying down on his bed of arrows. If it is a rich person who is guilty of a crime, you should not imprison him because it's at the cost of the public exchequer. Only a poor person who cannot afford to pay should be imprisoned. You may or may not agree with that value judgment, but it has an impeccable logic of its own. Who came up with this argument? Not the world bank. Bhishma again. These texts, I mentioned about the Valmiki Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Puranas were not being translated. The Sanskrit Pandits were not interested, except for the most popular one, the Bhagavad Puran, which I have seen. Which is why, as I said, a mad Bengali decided to translate them again. Last sentence and then I will stop. Last two sentences and then I will stop. I mentioned Vishnu Matsevatara. What was the river? mentioned the small fish. What was the river and what was the nature of the fish? 
Nope. The name of the river is Kritamala, which is a tributary of the Vaiga, which has become a Nala near Madurai railway station. Until I mentioned it to the finance minister who persuaded the community to set up a Kritamala revival mission. So Kritamala is being revived as we know. The Puranas were composed in different parts of the country. In parts of the country that come from the southern coastal regions, including this one in some way, that fish is a safari, which is a silvery white fish that you find in the sea. In Puranas that were composed in the eastern parts of the country, that same fish, same story, is a Rahu, Rohit Matsya. Last incident from the Puranas. In the Markande Purana, there is a story about a demoness named Jata Harini. <coughs> Jata Harini, as the name implies, is a demoness who steals a newborn infant from a house. Jata Harini. She then goes to another house where there is a newborn baby, takes this one, replaces that one with this one, takes that one, takes it to another house and generally causes confusion. <laughs> and of course you have dilemmas of dharma. I was born as a Kshatriya, I've been brought up in a Brahmana's house, what do do? All that. But Markandya Puran also tells us, Jata Harini devours, eats up every third baby. Anyone who is not a Sanskrit Pandit but is interested in the social sciences will immediately think, wait a minute, this is telling me that when this is composed, the infant mortality rate was one third. This is the kind of reason, not merely for governance, but for a broader reason, we need to bear a multidisciplinary lens on this rich corpus of texts of Itihas Purana. If you can read Sanskrit, read it in Sanskrit. If you can't read it in Sanskrit and you want to read it in English, Read mine because unfortunately nothing else is available. one should not form the impression that the script used was Devanagari. Devanagari as a script is of much more recent vintage. Sanskrit was written in all kinds of different scripts for some of which like Sharda in Kashmir we do not have too many people who can read the Sharda script any longer. I will give you an imperfect answer because the way Namami worked is for every state, a nodal body was identified. 
in the case of Karnataka also there will be a nodal body which I presume will be affiliated in some fashion with the University of Mysore. So you should check with them, not for handing them over right now, but at least for listing them. Uh, I can go back and check which is the nodal unit in Karnataka, but I'm inclined to think it will be the University of Mysore. In so far as donating them permanently is concerned, you should think of a place where they would be used and would not be sold off as scrap. Uh, one that comes to mind is the Vandakar Oriental Research Institute in Pune, but that comes much later. First is to find out about the local body. Check with my so I shall also check. I have heard Purana is Puranic Hinduism, while Veda is Vedic Brahminism. I want to know the difference between Hinduism and Brahminism. You will have to tell me who you heard that ridiculous quote from. <laughs> I am presently reading a book called Hinduism, written by, I think, Mishra or somebody, I don't write correctly like the name. It is a very exhaustively written book on various aspects of Hinduism. Okay. I would say this that you should not believe anything anyone says, including the person who has exerted himself to write this exhaustive book. Nor should you believe the net. Nor should you believe the big Devroy. It's always best to read what the texts say for themselves with one qualification. If one is interested, one has to be prepared to spend the time. It cannot be, please tell me, in 140 Twitter characters what Hinduism is because it is not instant coffee. But those who do not have the time, I think they do not, should not ask the question. Any? Professor Devrat, I want to know what year of the Kali Yuga they are in, how many years do we have? <laughs> That's a tough question. That's a tough question because I made a passing statement which provoked no one, but let's, let me assure you it will provoke a lot of people. Because when I said 4,000 years, 3,000 years, 2,000 years, 1,000 years, the reference in the text is to divine years, not human years. And uh, the time scale for devas is completely different. If I go by that divine scale, we are nowhere near the end of Kali Yoga. <laughs> if I go by my interpretation in terms of human years, we should be nearing the end of Kali Yoga soon, unless we already have. <laughs> Here. Sir, here. Sir, here. I'm here, sir. Yeah. The light is in my eyes. Okay, as long as I can hear the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a pretty academic question. Yeah. Uh, so, I was going through your Mahabharata abridged version. So. Not abridged version, that's not mine. Why not all are abridged? Okay. Uh, you, you seem to imply that uh, most of the characters in the Mahabharata are neither black or nor white. I mean, I don't that, imply that. The text. Do. Yeah, the text too. So I want I want to your uh, 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 I mean uh, your light. I mean I want you to throw a light on like if Krishna was uh, was uh, he danced on uh, I mean Gatotkacha's death. 
so how how do we uh, uh, come to a, I mean if, if you want to uh, see Krishna as the uh, uh, as the uh, I don't I'm not getting that uh, exact word so if you want to see Krishna as the hero of Mahabharata how do we con how do we how do we, how do we uh, reconcile uh, seeing Krishna dancing on Gatotvira's death or Rama uh, uh, killing ba Bali. Yeah. Let me start with Rama. <coughs> Let me start with Rama because I think it's an important question. All of our texts are about conflicts of dharma. It is not very clear to me what dharma is. Had it been clear, there would have been no text. Let me give an example of this. We know about Bhishma, Devavrata's vow of Brahmacharya. And we know about the princess of Kashi, whom Bhishma had brought to get married off to Vichitravedya. And this princess of Kashi said that now Shalya is not going to accept me, so please marry me. Bhishma said, sorry, I cannot marry you. I have my vow of Brahmacharya. So the princess of Kashi said, in that case, I will immolate myself in the fire and I will bring about your death. And she became Shikuni. Bhishma, vow of Brahmacharya. Question of saving a woman's life, he chose Brahmacharya. Arjuna had a temporary vow of Brahmacharya. Not a permanent one like Bhishma's, a temporary one. When the Naga princess Ulupi fell in love with Arjuna and said, if you do not marry me, I will kill myself. <coughs> Arjuna faced with that same conflict of dharma, do I maintain Brahmacharya or do I protect a woman's life, married the Naga princess Ulupi. Two different people, similar situations, both Kshatriyas made two different decisions. So the texts, what our texts tell us is that dharma is not there in black and white. It does not say thou shalt not kill. It does not say thou shalt not commit adultery. It depends on the context and in the same context you can take different decisions but what is important is that karma is the flip side of dharma. You take the decision and you will have to live with the consequences. Also in the Mahabharata there is the story of a sage named Kaushik. Kaushik had the vow that you would always speak the truth. Here was Kaushik seated under a tree. Along came some passers by running because they were being chased by some bandits. The passers by went that way. Bandits came along, asked Kaushik, which way did these, pass these passers by go? Kaushik, who always told the truth, said that way. Because you would not lie. The bandits caught up, slaughtered all of them, and Kaushik ended up in Narak in hell. And Kaushik said, what is my fault? And his fault was, it is not necessarily true that it's always good to tell the truth. And Krishna also says this in a different context. Now let me come to Rama. Rama's character is a most difficult one to understand and almost impossible to empathize with. Before Valmiki starts to compose the Valmiki Ramayana, he asks, 
who shall I write about? Who is there on earth? Who is Satya Sandha? Satyam does not mean truth only. Satya Sandha means someone who does not budge from his pledge. Come what may, I will not budge from my pledge. If we get married according to Hindu rites, we do Saptapadi, seven steps around the fire. Our texts say, it's not just for husband and wife, you take seven steps around the fire with someone, he becomes your friend. Rama has taken seven steps around the fire with Sugriva. They have taken the pledge that Rama will do everything possible to ensure that Sugriva becomes the king and Sugriva will do everything possible to ensure that Sita is found. To Rama, the most important thing is keeping that pledge. Overrides everything else. <coughs> You may not agree with what he did, but you must understand that this is what was driving him. I am Satya Sandha. I am Satya Sandha. I am the king. It is my rule to protect the subjects. Sita is my Sahadarmini. She is not my wife in the standard husband-wife sense. Since the subjects are complaining, my pledge to protect my subjects overrides everything else. We talk of Rama exiling Sita and say that it is unfair. Maybe, but let us understand the reasons why he did it. We sometimes forget that at the stroke of a pen, so to speak, Rama exiled Lakshmi. We forget that. His companion for so many years, because Lakshman had disturbed him, and Rama had said, anyone who disturbs me, I will kill him. So Lakshman was banished just like that. So far as Krishna or any of the other protagonists are concerned, when we look at them, let's not look at them in black and white terms. Finally, on Krishna, and I hope I don't end up provoking someone. <laughs> Do not look at the Kurukshetra war in isolation. Don't look at it in isolation. The Kurukshetra war was part of a larger jigsaw. What was the larger jigsaw? Bharatvarsha was divided into a large number of kingdoms all over. At the end of the Kurukshetra war, all of those kingdoms were destroyed. On the side of the Kurus, as well as on the side of the Pandavas. There was an undivided kingdom. Jarasandha being destroyed is also part and parcel of that jigsaw, not just Kurukshetra. Shishupal, all of them. So I hope there isn't any press, or if there is any press, I hope the press does not misquote me. <laughs> what Krishna did then was no different from what Sardar Patel did. He unified all of these different kingdoms and set up a centralized Samrajya.